Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 19th episode of VisionCon Spotlight, your in-depth look at the nerds you love. I'm your host, Zach Wilson, but you didn't come here to see me today. You came to see the man of the hour. He's seven primetime Emmy award-winning visual effects supervisor whose resume includes The Mandalorian, Star Trek, Game of Thrones, and countless other titles. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, the legend, Joe Bauer. Joe, how you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Nice <laughs> Andy, it's Andy, Joe. So, <laughs> Joe, a lot of people obviously know your work, but not enough people know the man behind the scenes. So for the folks watching at home, go ahead and tell them who you are and what are some other titles that you've worked on throughout the decades? Yeah, so I'm uh, Joe Bauer. You know what? I grew up in Springfield. Um, uh, we moved there from uh, North Carolina, where I was born in 1968. Do some math. And uh, and I uh, I uh, went to school there uh, through uh, high school and then uh, a year of college went uh, up to um, uh, Northern Missouri for university and then I left for uh, NYU in New York for grad school then I came back worked at KSBR for three years and then uh, moved out to LA in uh, 1991 so I've been working out here for very nearly 30 years. Um, so uh, you mentioned some of the things I've worked on, uh, which are sort of, frankly, the highlights, I think. Um, I've done quite a lot of, of uh, uh, or some number of movies, including probably the most popular this time of year is Elf, um, which I did uh, back in 2003 with Will Ferrell and uh, John Favreau and uh, you know that whole gang. And there's a, a making of, or it's actually sort of an anniversary special uh, highlighting it on Netflix right now um, that is kind of fun to watch um, but I also um, I did Get Smart for Warner Brothers with Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway in 2007 um, I did uh, The 13th Floor with Roland Emmerich I'm just sort of jumping around um, I did the second Final Destination 2 movie uh, which had the the big crash sequence on the freeway with the with the log truck, and that was fun. That was early on. I did one of the Blade movies. Uh, I did the uh, 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 Fantastic Four. Um, I did Fright Night with Colin Farrell, and uh, the late Anton Yelkin. Sadly, uh, hope, you know those kind of things. But I, w I was on um, Game of Thrones for seven years. Um, so that took a big chunk of time from season three through the finale. And then, as you said, I, uh, I uh, did the first four episodes of season two of Mandalorian. And I'm just starting a, a, a feature project at Warner Brothers right now. Without fail, whenever I'm driving and I'm like driving behind uh, a freighter that's hauling lumber, I always think of that scene from Final Destination 2. Oh, my God. You know what? I <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, so yeah. that, guys... A lot of, I mean, the, the name visual effects supervisor is kind of self-explanatory, but in case any of you watching right now aren't too familiar with the job, I actually prepared a slideshow for all of us, if you just give me one sec. And so I'm going to start us off with my favorite picture that I found. All right. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is one of the dragons from Game of Thrones, correct? What? That is uh, Viserion. So uh, we made that for um, uh, a season seven episode when the Night King throws a spear through Viserion's neck and he crashes into the frozen lake. Um, at the end of the episode, uh, all the, uh, the whites under the supervision of the White Walkers are pulling his dead uh, corpse out of, the, out of the lake and then um, the Night King puts his hand on and, and uh, brings him back to life with the blue eyes. So we needed something to frame on with the camera uh, when the Night King is coming up, and the Night King also needed some way of knowing where to put his hand, that sort of thing. So, uh, so this was made from the 3D, uh, the computer-generated 3D model, and then printed at scale. So that's the real scale of the dragon head, of the Viserion head. Drogon was 20% uh, bigger. Oh, my God. One of the most iconic scenes in the show. And just, I, I just love <laughs> that you're just, like, right next to it for scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so we got this one. So as I mentioned, seven primetime Emmy Awards and then a plethora of other awards, but is there anything special about this one? Um, I think this would have 
been, I don't know if this was season seven or eight. Uh, I mean, what was special was really, uh, you know, winning every year. Um, I don't know what, what, you know, what planets came together for Game of Thrones, but, you know, we won everything that we were nominated for and some things we didn't even realize that we were nominated for, but, you know, we got a Hong Kong Academy Award. We got two Australian Academy Awards. I'm just listing things you wouldn't know otherwise. Um, you know, Visual Effects Society Awards, um, um, HPA. I'm trying to remember what that stands for. But anyway, you know, it was just, it was uh, sort of numbing to to just keep winning. And I think, you know, we, you know, as the show ended, you know, so much other great work came up, and obviously including The Mandalorian that uh that we handed the baton off to you know other creative teams but it was a really fun you know feature of every year you know even when we were shooting in northern ireland we'd all uh dust off our tuxes and fly back to la for the for the emmys um and uh i don't know it was just uh you know it's still hard to sort of comprehend you know how how normal it all feels after a while but uh it was lucky very surreal i would assume yeah, it is. Well, and speaking of kind of hard to comprehend, uh, this next one, I didn't exactly, well, here, I'll, I'll show it. So this one, I always assumed it was just visual effects magic that made these giants look as big as they were. And granted, I'm sure that's some of it as well. But I mean, look at this. I mean, this is clearly, he's clearly a behemoth, you know, compared to you size wise. So how did you pull this one off? Well, he's on a, a raised platform. So but he is a, a very big guy that uh, my idea for the the giants, and this is um, uh, I'm trying to see if this is one one or it might be. I think it is one one. Uh, would have been shot during uh, um, the uh, Battle of the Bastards. There was also the same actor, Ian White, who is uh, seven foot six or seven, um, uh, uh, played a different uh, decayed uh, giant for the for the Long Night in season eight. Um, but the, the point was that if, you know, you cast the largest people you could find, they would move in a certain way that would scale well with the, with the size they were supposed to be rather than casting a normal sized person who's trying to act large. Um, you know, and we sort of semi-weighted the feet a little bit and just designed the whole costume so they sort of looked like a pyramid. So even when you were just looking straight at them, it felt like you were looking up. Uh, you know, there's just those little clues that the that the makeup and the costume people got on board with. And uh, anyway, so uh, he would, I can't see if he's got arrows in him. I think he does. He does. Probably Battle of the Bastards. And I think that was right after the scene where, um, uh, uh, you know, they're already in the fight and John and Tormund look and um, uh, a bunch of, I guess it's the wildlings are running toward them and, and one one is leading the charge and then he swats the horse and the horse eyes sort of past camera. I think we had just shot that and I walked past Ian and gave him a fist bump. <laughs> That's so incredible. So this one, so we're jumping a little bit back in time for this one for uh, Star Trek, if I'm correct. It is. It's uh that would be Voyager and, um, that would have been for the Voyager pilot. Um, and that if you turn it upside down, you'll see the general shape is, is the Voyager um, uh, model. And it's the same size as the, this is just a cardboard cutout for framing, but it's the same size as the, as the physical model that we were shooting at that time. This would have been just at the transition from model work to CG. So I think the, the planet that it's a it's um the voyager and let me remember the name of the other ship the little one um well i can't get there but um but uh um they they are uh, orbiting a planet i believe so the planet would have been cg in space and then the models we would have photographed in a number of passes so uh dan curry's on the right who was, was with uh Star Trek since the very first, since the pilot of Next Generation in the 80s. Uh, then I'm in the background there, David Stipes and Jim Ryder, who would have been programming the motion control. And then we got one more that I just wanted to end on because I thought it was very cute and funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell me all about this one. 
Okay, so that's, uh, uh, I'm on the right. Steve Kolbeck, my effects producer, is on the left. And uh, Steve had been on the show since the second season. Uh, I wasn't available to join him, but I did join him in the third season of uh, Game of Thrones. And this is, um, would have been a season four episode, I think, judging by the size of the dragons. Um, and we were in, we were shooting in, uh, an air, uh, in Croatia in, uh, in an old Roman palace. And, um, this is when Danny is locking up, uh, the dragons, um, uh, beneath the pyramid. And so just for, uh, framing, we, uh, you know, we had, um, um, these, uh, uh, we call them stuffies, but anyway, they're sculptures, uh, painted sculptures of the dragon's heads. That's uh, almost the last time we were able to do sculptures that were proper scale for the dragons, uh, because every year the dragons doubled in size. Um, I think we, well, I guess we did the, the green head that we looked at later. That would have been the last time. And then the dragons, you know, kept growing. So then we, we you know, we, we could have done a fingernail or, a, you know, something like that. But it, uh, we had to, to uh, we couldn't shoot reference like this. So basically Steve and I are performing as if we are the dragons for some take and somehow that landed on the internet and it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I got a kick out of it when I saw it. So obviously you're a household name, Joe, you know, you're one of the most iconic, famous and successful people in the industry. But I got to ask, was this always the plan? Did you always you know, when you grew, when you were growing up, did you say one day I'm going to become the one of the greatest visual effects supervisors to ever live, or did something happen along the way that kind of led you to this point? Um, you know what? Um, I grew up on the east side of town in uh, at a farm, a uh, small farm that my uh, grandmother had, and then uh, um, uh, gifted to my parents when my dad got out of the military. Um, and you know, even as a, a kid in grade school, I just you know I I, I subscribed to a magazine that was uh, very rare um, because there weren't very many films, certainly horror movie magazines. There was something called Famous Monsters of Filmland. And, um, and I, you know, every week and eventually toward the end of the month, every day I'd run to the mailbox at the end of the driveway to see if the new issue was in. And when it was there, you rip it open, you smell the new ink, and then I would just like disappear into it for weeks. So, um, you know, and then I, I discovered from reading that, I discovered an uh, animator named Ray Harryhausen, um, who had been making monster films since the 50s and actually even worked on Mighty Joe Young in the 40s. Um, and he passed away in 2013 um, at uh, pushing 100 years old, not quite 100. But um, anyway, so I guess that's a long, you know, the long answer is, or the short answer is that, yeah, I always wanted to do this. Um, you know, and when I saw The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, which was uh, a new movie in 1973 by Ray Harryhausen, you know, I just became really focused on stop motion and making my own, you know, sculpting my own models and, you know, pouring the rubber and making the metal armatures and doing all that. You know, and there were a couple of friends around who were interested. Um, uh, and then cutting to 2003, we were doing, we were animating the narwhal for Elf. Uh, the, when he says, bye, buddy, hope you find your dad. And I found out that Ray was in town uh, from because he lived in London and he was in uh, Orange County. And so I call, I found out how to get a hold of where he was staying. And I pitched the whole movie of Elf to him on the phone. And I had never spoken to him before, but I was in shock to be on the phone with him. And he said it sounded fun and he would love to be a voice. So uh, New Line uh, threw us in a van with a uh, recording uh, team and we went out and I spent the day with him. I know. And we, yeah. And we recorded his voice. He ends up, John uh, Favreau ended up doing the, the voice that's in the movie for the Narwhal. So Ray is the, is the animated uh, polar bear. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> I was actually, speaking of Elf, I was telling uh, my parents before, uh, we started this, you know, because I was super psyched, you know, Game of Thrones, Mandalorian, Star Trek, all things. My mom, you know, I love her to death, but she was like, oh, that, that's great, honey. But then when I told her, oh, you also worked on Elf, oh, she lost her mind. <laughs> <laughs> Elf uh, it was a very special movie we watched uh, when we were growing up. But um, so we talked a little bit and we touched a little bit on it during that kind of behind the scenes slideshow. 
But I did want to ask, are there any specific things that you include in like your process or without giving any trade secrets, of course, but uh, is there anything like, let's say for instance, uh, a different show uh, comes to you and be like, hey, we want a dragon breathing fire. What are some of the things that you'd like to tailor in order to make that a thing? Um, well, you know, um, as soon as we needed to do it for Game of Thrones, um, I decided to to shoot as much um, photographically as opposed to going right to the CG because if you don't have the resources to do the CG well, you know, it really kind of ruins the whole drama that you're watching. So, you know, that was early days on the show. And, uh, you know, so we worked very close with special effects guys and, you know, we did a flamethrower, you know, it wasn't a big one. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a dangerous stunt when you, you're standing there next to somebody who's burning, uh, which is, you know, it's always nerve wracking until they give a thumbs up that they're okay. Um, you know, and then by season eight, you know, we had, uh, you know, we were burning, you know, 20 guys at a time. So, you know, all I would say is get a good dragon designer um, who knows something about, um, you know, about nature and you know, if if this dragon were to have developed along with lizards and horny toads and, you know, anything else, you know, Komodo dragons on the earth, you know, uh, which we are things that we recognize, you know, then, uh, uh, you know, if you want something that is believable, then cue off of nature, um, you know, and then if, if that's, you know, if you're doing a Chinese dragon or something super stylized, that's something else. Um, but that's what we did. And we worked with a, a company in uh, in Stuttgart, Germany, um, and then a, a fella who specializes in designing dragons. Um, and then if he's got to breathe fire, if you don't have ILM or Weta, Peter Jackson's company, or you know somebody who can really do the fire fire well, then go out and shoot your own. <laughs> so you're telling me that a lot of uh, the scene, because there's quite a few scenes during Game of Thrones where people are literally on fire. I guess I always assumed that was just, you know, just visual effects, CGI, but you're telling me that they were actually on fire? They were actually on fire when- How, um, how does one safely, I mean, I hesitate to use the word safely, but uh, safely do that? Well, safety is, is the ultimate thing. And, you know, it's really it falls to the stunt people, the stunt coordinator, but um, in season five, I think when Danny um, and her gang are in the, um, in the uh, Dasnak fighting pit in Marine, and they're uh, about to be killed by the Sons of the Harpy, and then uh, Drogon flies into the arena, lands, and uh, and rescues them. Um, you know, I had, at that point, you know, the dragon was not quite 100 feet long, but he was pretty big. And, um, and I figured the best, the best result would be if we pre-animated the the dragon and then translated that to a motion controlled crane rig with a flamethrower on it. And then we also put the camera on, on a rig, you know, a computer rig as well. And then we had all the stunt guys out there and they really got hit with real fire in the, this bull ring that we were shooting in Spain. Um, so we set all that up and, um, you know, the stunt guys loved it because they, they, uh, you know, you could play it back again and again. So they knew exactly what the parameters were. But the way you light somebody on fire is you coat them with this gel, then you put a, a like kind of a wetsuit on them, and then you put more gel on them, then you put the costume on them. They have to have um, uh, fireproof hands, a fireproof head, you know, the, and they have to breathe through a tube because the gel is poisonous if you breathe it in. So, but it does keep you from burning. So, uh, so each of those guys had to, breathe through a tube, fill their lungs with oxygen, then remove the tube, and then wait for the camera to roll, then do all of their performance, including getting caught on fire, and then have people run in and put them out before they could breathe again. So um, they all drive Maseratis now because you get paid a lot to do that stuff. <laughs> but, and some of the guys, you know, did it multiple times. So, uh, but it's a very complicated thing. Oh my God. And I better not hear any of the folks watching at home trying that at home. No, no. You know, you can die really quick if, if you don't know what you're doing. That's all. Yeah. And, but I will say, um, uh, after all of that, there was one fellow who had a blister on his pinky and that's the only 
injury that I heard of, you know, because, but this is a very, you know, a top notch team. And in fact, we ended up burning more people on camera than had ever been done before for any feature film or any TV show, including wow. Brave. I think Braveheart had the, had the, uh, um, had the most uh, prior to us. Man, seven primetime Emmy Awards and most burned people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a lot of people who watch this show, Joe, obviously are here to see the amazing guests like the one that's sitting right before me. But a lot of them also watch the show because they're either in the entertainment industry or wanting to get into the entertainment industry and just want to know what to do next to get to the next level. So what advice would you give anybody watching right now who wants to get into visual effects work, possibly any advice that you'd give them that you maybe wish you had when you first started out? Um, well, the industry changed since I came out here because it, it was, um, you know, it wasn't CG based. It wasn't a, a computer graphics world yet. Um, and when I came out, I didn't realize that there was a writer strike going. So I really had the deck stacked against me. Um, and I also didn't have that much money in my pocket to, to live while I was looking. Uh, so that was a little touch and go, but I mean, the best thing, you know, right now you can, you know, assuming that getting into visual effects for people means getting into computer graphics. Um, it's, it, you know, there are many opportunities to learn, um, you know, to learn the uh, the techniques and the programs and the software um, all of that um, the best thing is understand photography um, which you really have to seek out those classes which don't seem to much exist anymore and and art you know uh, fine art because um, you know if you're going to design shots you need to understand lighting and you need to understand composition so you know um, now I never was a, you know, I avoided sitting down at a box and, you know, except for Photoshop, which is, I use in the course of giving notes, but, you know, I didn't work my way up from a facility artist to a supervisor. Um, the fellow that hired me basically off the street, David Stipes, uh, liked my work, liked my, you know, my eye. And I was supervising pretty much right away. You know, the, the finale of the next generation with the three enterprises, um, and you know, they all end up blowing up. I blew up two of them. So, <laughs> oh my God. so, uh, so I, you know, um, you know, it depends, but, but I was an art major before that. And I did go to film school before that. So I knew photography, lighting, and I, and I was, you know, and I knew art and, you know, especially with Game of Thrones, um, you know, it, it needed to have a real feeling, but it also was sort of heightened and very dramatic. And I think if I if I wasn't uh, you know educated in those ways, I wouldn't have done as good a job. Well, and lastly, before we wrap things up, Joe, we've talked a lot about your work, kind of the ins and outs, behind the scenes stuff. But where can people go to enjoy more of your work, either past, current, or future? Or where can they just go to find more Joe? That sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> um. Well, gosh, I don't know, Netflix, maybe, um, uh, Disney Plus. Um, you know, there's, I don't recommend all the Joe that's out there, but, uh, but uh, you know, there's, there's some things I'm, I'm proud of. Fortunately, the, one of the things I, I had the most fun doing happens to air every year. Um, you know, I put my, uh, as soon as I, I was standing on set next to Bob Newhart in his pointy ears and curly Jews, I said, Bob, can I um, can I put you on the phone with my mom? And I said, sure. So I called on my phone. I called my mom, and I said, Mom, say hi to my friend Bob. And I didn't tell her who it was, and I only heard his side of the conversation. And eventually, he went, No, 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 Mrs. Bauer, I really am Bob Newhart. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so, um, you know, it, the stuff's around. It's never been easier to find. Uh, you know, I tend to watch Game of Thrones just going down memory lane on YouTube more than anything else. But, but uh, I will say for the uh, season eight episode, The Long Night, which broadcasts so dark, if you, uh, if you look at it now, but better if you go to the Blu-ray, which is available, you'll see what we had in mind. Mm -hmm. 
right. Well, and then I got a bunch of links for the folks watching home. If you just look right down there in the description box below, got a ton of links to take you to everything and more. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 19 of Vision Con Spotlight. Before we wrap things up, Joe, any final thoughts to leave us on? Words of wisdom, anything? Um, you know what? Um, I had a professor at, at Southwest Missouri State tell me uh, the secret. He called it the secret of life, and he didn't tell us till the final day of class. And it ended up being very simple. Do what you want to do. So I'll relay that. Do what you want to do. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode eight, or 19, rather, of VisionCon Spotlight. I, of course, am your host, Zach Wilson. But much more importantly, this has been my very special guest, Joe Bauer. Make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below. Until next time, guys, always remember that life's better when you have friends to share it with.